Knowledge is to have that deep sense of what church is teaching, what the teachings of the Bible is, and then I stick to it. Whether I get mocked for that, maybe people will tell, or people will say, oh, he's an extremist, or he's a fundamentalist. I am a liberal. Now again, we have a very wrong notion of what liberal is, what extremist is. If we are saying that, that you are so strict, you are sticking to the rules and regulations and therefore you are an extremist, then Jesus is the person who is the most extremist person. What did he say? He said, I am the truth. He did not say, I am one of the truths. He's very clear about it. I am the way. He's not saying that, oh, I am one of the ways. I am a liberal kind of person, so all the ways are leading to me. Not say that. Or I am the life. He's very clear, very distinct about it. Liberal or, or extremist that we are having in our mind is completely different. If I am sticking to the rules and regulations, if I am sticking to the order, it does not mean that I am an extremist or fundamentalist. Inclusivity does not mean that I include all the things. That's not inclusivity. There's a person who came to me and said, with the coming of Pope Francis, the church has become more inclusive. What's the meaning? What do you mean by that? I mean, the church is now including many things. The things that was not included before, now the church is including. Is that the meaning of inclusive? Church cannot be more inclusive than it has been. It's not that with the coming of Pope Francis, the church has become more inclusive. It has been inclusive right from the beginning. Praise the Lord. It does not mean now today church is including many things which were sinful before. Now it is including that. For example, before the church was saying homosexuality is a sin. Now the church is saying homosexuality is not a sin. Some people have got that notion. Because Pope Francis said, who am I to judge? He does not find anything wrong with homosexuality. And so today the church is accepting homosexuality and so the church has become more inclusive. How much blinded we have become today? Church is never saying even today that homosexuality is not a sin. We know that the media that we are so much addicted to, media, internet, newspaper, televisions, we know one thing that truth is not given to us as it is. It's all colored truth. It's true that Pope Francis said, who am I to judge? But that does not mean that he is giving approval to homosexuality. Again, if we go to the bottom of the truth, we know that what is happening there. The interviewer is asking about this particular priest who is caught in the act of homosexuality. This priest who knows that what he did was sinful, was very evil thing. He is repenting over his sin, going and receiving the sacrament of confession. Now the interviewer is asking Pope, what do you think about this priest? Will he go to the heaven or hell? And Pope Francis said, who am I to judge him? What's the meaning? If this priest has truly repented over the sin of homosexuality, if this priest has made a genuine confession, he has received the mercy of God. He has received the forgiveness of God. Now, if God has forgiven him, who am I to judge him? Who am I to judge him? That's the standpoint of the church. If God has forgiven any, any person, who are we to judge him or her? But that does not mean that now church is saying this activity is not sinful. Take the case we read in the Gospels. So many sinners are coming to Jesus. Jesus is forgiving their sins. But Jesus is not saying that now onwards you can continue to have the sin in your life. The prostitute. Jesus is forgiving her sin. Jesus never said now, now you go and you commit more sins. After forgiving the sin, Jesus said, do not do it again. Do not do it again. That means Jesus is not approving that what she did was something good. Same is the case. If today the church is... is having such a statement, who am I to judge? Simply means this, the activity is sinful even today. Even today that's the same thing, the teaching of the church has not changed. One another person came and said, I thought with the coming of Pope Francis, 
divorce will be allowed. Because the way he was acting, I thought that immediately he's going to give divorce. So that's the impression that people are getting. People are thinking that church has become more inclusive because many of the teachings are now under the flux. It's going to change. It is we who have the responsibility to tell them the truth is the same. The same. It's not changed. Why the, why the church cannot change these truths? Because they are, these are eternal truths. We cannot change them. We cannot sugarcoat them. We have to, we have to give the truth as it is. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Therefore, we have to spend time. We have to spend time knowing what the church is teaching, what is happening in the church. We spend so much time reading the newspaper, updating ourselves about things happening in the world. Very good thing. It's a very good thing. But how much time and energy I'm spending in order to know what the church is teaching? What is the meaning of the Bible? Because that's the first responsibility we all have got. People look up to us to know about the truth, what God wants them to do. So that's the gift of knowledge. If I don't have that interest, that means the gift of the Spirit is not working in me. I have interest in all other kinds of information. I want to know all other kinds of information. But I don't have interest or passion to know about this information. I can understand. The gift of knowledge is not at work. So gift of wisdom, gift of understanding, gift of knowledge. Gift of counsel. Gift of counsel. What is this gift of counsel? Now again, it does not mean that I must have a person with me and I should be counseling that person. Gift of counsel is completely different. St. Thomas Aquinas defines. What is gift of counsel? It is good judgment. Good judgment. Good judgment with regard to the deep things. How much I'm able to judge the things about my moral life or about my relationship with God. That is the gift of counsel. I remember a girl sharing her experience. She said she was committing this sin, this unholy relationship. She was into that again and again. She said, Father, it all began in a good way. This man was sending WhatsApp messages, spiritual messages, good messages, great messages. And that's how our relationship began. But I, don't, I do not know what happened in between. I was not able to discern when all those spiritual matters were disappearing. And when this relationship took a worldly turn. I was not able to discern that. Today, I am into that sin. I look back and I, I hope or I, I I really pray that if I could have made that judgment, it would have been so easy for me. It's a case of that boiling frog. We know that if this gift of counsel is not at work in us, we are like that boiling frog. We know that we have heard about that story. If you put a frog in a boiling water, it immediately jumps out. But if you are putting this frog in a water and slowly heating up the water, will not jump out. It will be boiled to death. Now, if I'm saying that it is the boiling water which killed the frog, I'm mistaken. It was its inability to decide when to jump out of that situation. It was not able to make that judgment. Same is the case. We are facing so many situations in our life. So many people coming into our life. So many things happening in our life. I have to make that judgment. What is that right moment to jump out of this relationship or to jump out of this situation? If I'm able to make that, I can understand. The gift of counsel is at work in my life. So, let us pray to the Lord if we have lost in some way in the past. We are not able to make that judgment. Now, for us, good is bad, bad is good, everything is same. Whether you do it this way, that way, everything is same. If we have lost that ability to judge, let's pray to the Lord. Let's come to the Lord and ask for the gift of counsel. Jesus said, if you ask, you will receive it. You will receive it. The thing is that the principle of the Bible is I have to come and I have to keep asking. 
So if I have this gift of judgment, many of the things I would be spared in my life. Many of the sinful situations in my life, I would be spared. Maybe I'll, I'm looking at the picture. The pictures are all, all over the place. But when is the moment I have to, I have to turn my eyes from that picture? It's very important to have that judgment. If I am fixing my eyes on that particular picture, it could be possibility that I am, I am slipping into that sin of lust. So this is very important, the gift of counsel. That means making good judgment. It's not only in the matter of moral life, it's also in the life of discerning the call of God. Making that prudential feel. We know about Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa, she had this gift of counsel. So much at work. When God is calling her to do a particular work, she is able to discern it. And she is able to make a judgment. And this is, this is what God is asking me to do. And so she is getting down to that slums of Calcutta. It was so difficult. It was so difficult, but she is able to feel that this is what God is telling me. That prudential feel to do the right thing. To do the right thing at the right time is the gift of counsel. If we lack that, let us pray to the Lord. That's all we can do in order to gain this. That's the gift of counsel. Gift of fortitude. Gift of fortitude. Again, another important gift. There's a man, I was reading about this man lately. His name is Sadhu Sundar Singh. He was a convert. He was a Hindu. He converted to Christianity. This is what he says. It is easy to die for Christ. It is easy to die for Christ, but it is so difficult to live for him. It's much easier to die for Christ because it may take only one hour or two hours. But to live for Christ is to die every moment. So difficult. Now, if we don't have this fortitude, that means courage. That's what fortitude is, courage, strength. If I don't have fortitude or courage, I cannot live for Christ. I'll have that compromised situations in life. If I'm having that fear dominating my life, as we said, fear prevents us. There are unnecessary fears in our life that prevents us from following the Lord. If I'm not free from such fears, I cannot really obey the Lord. I remember again another lady sharing her experience. She said, even after knowing that fornication is a sin, I was committing it again and again. Why? Because I feared that this boyfriend of mine would leave me if I don't yield to his request. That fear, which is so unnecessary. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, there might be possibilities or there might be occasions where you have to abandon your own near and dear ones. For my sake, you may have to abandon many things. Many things that are beloved to you, many things that you love very much, many things that you desire so much, you will have to abandon. So we need strength and courage in order to follow Jesus in, in, our, in our consecrated life, in our Christian life. We need this. There are times when we are not able to speak to people because we fear if we say this truth of the Lord to them, they will not again come to us. This person is helping me financially. Or maybe this is a person who is my benefactor, who has given me so much of money, donated so much of money. But when it comes to speaking the truth to this person, I fear because if I say that, he or she may not turn again to help me. And so whatever he or she is doing, I say it's okay. It's okay. That's a lack of courage, strength. I remember a man who was helping the parish priest. He has donated so much of money for the building of that church. And so, when this man asked for divorce, parish priest not even made an effort. If I speak that the divorce is something evil, this person will not help me again. This person has helped me so much to build up the structure. So I must show that kind of, 
what we say, that, that kind of favor back to him. So I keep my mouth shut and I help him to get divorced. There are priests and religious doing that. Doing that. Helping or keeping quiet. I do not know what this person is going to do if I say about this. So better that I keep quiet. Or, as we said about contraceptives, we are so silent about this contraceptive. We think that if we speak about contraceptives, against contraceptives, people will not hear us. On the other hand, what my experience was, many people coming and sharing, Father, we never heard that it was so evil. We never heard. No one told us about it. It's only here now we are coming to know that what we were doing was so evil thing. Was so against the church, so against the teachings of the Lord. We fear to open our mouth to speak to the people. Because we lack that courage, that fortitude. There are people who really want to know. And we could be the only possibility for them. Remember what Jesus did. He is not bothered about how many people is going to follow him. He's not bothered about it. Whether I get the majority or the minority, he's not bothered about it. The truth is truth. We read in the Gospel of St. John chapter 6. He's teaching about the Eucharist. Thousands of people are turning away from him. What is he doing? He's not going around, he's not running after them and saying, please come back, I'll change my teaching or I'll try to give you in a more suitable way. He's letting them go. If you cannot eat my flesh, if you cannot drink my blood, you're free to go. And then he is going to the 12 disciples and saying, do you also wish to leave? Go. He is never going to compromise with his truths. That's what we learn from Jesus. I remember this man who came to me and said, Father, if you take an opinion poll today, if you take an opinion poll today, most of the Catholics are not doing what the church is teaching. The Catholics are using contraceptives, they're going for IVF, they are having homosexuality, they are having all kinds of things opposing the church. So what is the meaning of the teachings of the church? Why can't the church change its teachings so that it can include more people? How foolish that argument is. He's saying to take the opinion poll and see that majority of people are not following the church. So let us change the teachings of the church. The attitude of Jesus is completely different. He's not taking the opinion poll. How many of you can follow my teachings? And then I will pass the teaching. He is giving the command. Whether you follow it or not, it's your problem. If you are thinking in that way, that we have to accommodate with the trends of the world, it's so wrong. The world is not here to be changed by the trends of the world. On the other hand, the church is here to mold the world. The church is here to change the trends of the world. That's the role of the church. That's the role of the church. That we have to change the world, not the other way around. Some priests, some religious, they say that we have to change according to the times and situations and circumstances. And what's the meaning of the role of the church? If we are changing time from time to time, there's no need of the church. Church is here as the voice of Christ. Whether people listen it or not, as we heard, God telling Jeremiah, Ezekiel also, he's telling that. Whether people listen to you or not, it's not your problem. You have to keep speaking. You have to keep preaching my word. That's what your duty is. So same is the duty of the church. Whether people follow it or not, we have to keep preaching. And what we can do is make the teaching of the church more convincing to the people. And there are people. There are people who are willing to follow the teachings of the church. Praise the Lord. So that is the gift of courage, the gift of fortitude. We need this courage in order to follow Jesus. The next gift of the Holy Spirit is piety. Piety. Now what is piety? It might seem to us some kind of sentimental thing some kind of emotional thing. When we think about piety, we think about that church lady going to the church, lighting candles or having a rosary in hand. That's the picture that comes to our mind. But piety is totally different. Piety is a manly virtue. And what is piety? St. Thomas Aquinas says, it's a sense of justice. It's a sense of justice towards my God. I am 
repaying to the Lord what he has done he has given me life he has given me life and he has saved me he has redeemed me he has given me so many blessings and favors so it's my duty that I repay him and what can I repay him thanks and praise that's all I do not have anything else I cannot give back to the Lord anything else other than thanks and praise so I come to the Lord I thank and praise God out of the sense of justice now that is what we have to teach people and that is what we have to understand what are we teaching people you thank and praise God so that you can get things from him or you you thank and praise God so that you be healed that's all secondary the first thing about praise and worship is I am praising God because he has already done so many great things in my life so this is my duty my obligation that I must come to him and I must praise and worship him now if we are focusing that you come to the Eucharist so that your problems be solved we are so wrong we are coming to the Eucharist as an act of justice I'm coming to the Eucharist I'm taking part in the Eucharist not to get something out of it but I am doing it as an act of justice we know that as we said earlier if someone is doing something good to me we feel that obligation to to do good something back to him that comes automatically same is the case piety means I have that great sense of justice I have to give this back to the Lord it's an obligation that I have and therefore the scripture we read angels they are continuously praising and worshiping God it's not that God is commanding them to praise and worship God does not need any one of us as Saint Irenaeus is saying God does not need our praise and worship it's not like the pagan God the pagan God the understanding of the pagan God is he has created us so that we can praise and worship him we can be at his service he does not need our service that's what Saint Irenaeus is teaching us he does not need our service it is my right it is it is my need that I am praising and worshiping him not his need if I am serving him it is not his need it is my need it's my obligation so a person who's saying that I'm not getting anything out of Eucharist who cares whether I get anything out of Eucharist or not I'm coming to the Eucharist because the Lord has done great things in my life and I want to praise and worship him that's the real way of looking at this gift of piety a sense of justice sense of justice or if I'm praying rosary if I'm praying rosary what is the first first thing in my mind am I praying rosary to get something out of it I'm praying rosary out of thanks and praise that are filling my heart out of that I'm praising and worshiping. so any act will become an act of piety only when I'm doing it out of the sense of justice I'm kneeling down for hours and hours and I'm praying to God that act will become only an act of piety when it comes out of a heart that is full of praise and worship if I'm kneeling down in order to get something done from God it's not an act of piety it is some kind of business happening there not piety or if I'm going to some pilgrim pilgrim centers maybe there are people who walk on the knees and all kinds of stuff people do well and good it's not wrong we're saying well and good but with what intention I'm doing it if I'm doing it with out of praise and worship to the Lord definitely that's an act of piety even if I burn a candle people who burn candles out of out of praise and worship to the Lord it's an act of piety it's an act of piety and therefore let us not discourage people let us not say that it is some kind of superstition if people are having a different notion about it let us correct let us tell them that whatever you're doing it should be out of praise and worship to the Lord praise the Lord praise the Lord hallelujah hallelujah praise you Jesus thank you Jesus we read st. Luke very beautifully explaining this to us st. Luke Joseph and Mary they are bringing child Jesus to the temple and St. Luke says there is this old lady in the temple called Anna she's not leaving the temple day in and day out she's in the temple she's a pious lady St. Luke says 
very pious lady not because she is not leaving the temple she is praying and fasting it's not because of that she is pious she is not leaving the temple so that she can praise and worship the Lord she is praying and fasting as an act of justice to the Lord she is worshiping the Lord it's because of that she is pious so st. Luke is teaching this very beautifully to us whatever we do it could be a very small activity very small activity if I'm doing that activity out of out of thanks and praise to God it is an act of piety praise the Lord praise the Lord the last one is the fear of the Lord fear of the Lord again it can be it can be interpreted in a bad way we know that today in the world we say that you don't have to fear fear is a bad thing but we know that when the scripture is teaching about the fear of the Lord it is not interpreting in that way there are two kinds of fear there's a slavish fear servile fear I do things because I fear that person because that person is more powerful than me now there are people who do that today people who follow God out of fear for punishment we also many times teach people that same way do things otherwise he's going to punish you otherwise he's going to curse you but that's not what Bible is expecting from us we have to obey God not out of servile fear but out of filial fear a fear of the son and that is completely different think about that prodigal son Jesus giving that parable of the prodigal son this elder brother he's so disturbed he's so upset with his father and what's he saying all these years I have been working for you like a slave all these years I've been working for you like a slave and what happened he's not able to experience joy and peace in his life Jesus is not expecting from us such kind of obedience so if I am leading a holy life or if I am faithful to my consecrated life if I am living up to my calling it should not be out of fear that otherwise he's going to punish me he's going to damn me to hell of course he has got all that power but I'm not focusing on that if I'm faithful to my consecrated life if I want to lead a holy life if, if I want to obey the commandments of God it should be out of my fear that comes out of respect the feel your fear son respects his father he respects his father he does not do anything by which he hurts his father I do not want to do anything by which I lose this relationship with my father but well, that's the fear which Bible is expecting from us so whatever I'm doing it should be with that perspective I do not want to lose this relationship with my God and therefore I'm obeying him not out of servile fear mentality of the slave no God wants us to respect him just as a son respects the father that's what fear of the Lord is so seven gifts of the Holy Spirit wisdom understanding knowledge counsel fortitude piety and fear of the Lord with this we can examine our conscience a little bit of this information that st. Thomas Aquinas is helping us with we can sit back and think are these gifts at work in my life if not let me come to the Lord and pray let me pray to the Lord for that Spirit of God to help me so that I can be more faithful I can be obeying the Lord I can lead a more virtuous life and I can lead a more moral life 